Hello, you're listening to the Saluki Games Cast. This is June 10th, 2022. It's Friday. This is Unlucky Episode 13. So, did, did we just do episode 13 on a Friday? We have Friday the 13th. <laughs> yes, but it's only Friday, June 10th. So, I don't feel like we're fully cursing ourselves. <laughs> But there's probably a good reason that Alicia Utech is here and O.J. Duncan is here and Ryan Friels again has <laughs> has dodged out because he's afraid of Friday the 13th. <laughs> it's okay, Ryan. We have my purse here as your stand-in. Oh. We'll occasionally ask it what games it's been playing, how it enjoys visual novels. <laughs> Alicia has placed a hockey mask over it. So. <laughs> Please don't be scared of Alicia's purse. <laughs> um, Alicia, how have you been this week? It's been a good week. The sun is shining. Not too busy. Just been able to kind of chill out for a little bit, which has been very nice. And it's not that time of the semester. It is not that time of the semester. I'm done with my summer student class. Great. Uh, OJ, how are you doing? Oh, I'm Okay. I'm uh, I'm working on my first prelim question. It's due tonight, so I. It, it seems weird to me that like a two to three page question that I'm saying, hey, I want to write about this, is more daunting than like a thirty page paper that I've written inside of a class, for a final. Um, but yeah, I'm. But I I feel good about it. I should be done shortly after this, so. Uh, I'll be okay. Well, until I have the next question due, which is in two weeks. <laughs> It so, is that time of the semester for you. Yeah, it's that time of the prelims. <laughs> so what is daunting about writing this question? Is it the idea that whatever you write, you then have to answer at some point? So it's sort of like choose your own doom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, like I'm, I'm trying to put two things together that go together, right? So I'm trying to put like queer theory and stigma theory together. And, you know, they work together beautifully, but... I can just see myself, like, when the timer starts where I have to start writing about it, just, like, having a blank and, like, not being able to write anything for it. Even though, like, two of those things are, like, stuff that I'm I'm very well versed in. Um, and then I would feel really, really bad if I couldn't write anything for a question that I came up with for myself. Yeah. That, <laughs> what a mood. <laughs> that seems uh, very much like s the definition of self-defeating, right? Yeah. Like you have <laughs> written a question that you yourself cannot answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's probably pretty good training for being a teacher, though. Like if you can write questions you can't answer, then that's a good lesson of how to write tests in the future for other students. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think I'm going to have a whole new, uh, like, uh a lot more respect for students who have to deal with prompts that I write after this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Justin, we, how are you? We haven't I, asked you in a while. That, that's, well, you haven't asked me all of you <laughs> yeah. at the same time in a while. Um, I'm doing good. Um, it's been uh, a good few weeks. I am um, like you. I am very much enjoying the weather. Uh, it's been finally starting to feel like summer on a consistent basis <laughs> because for a long time there, it felt like we were, you know, up in the 80s one day and then back down into the 50s the next day. And so it's been really nice for it to be sort of a consistent summer. And, um, you know, a lot of my projects have wrapped up from the school year. So at this point, I'm actually getting to enjoy and relax uh, as part of the summer. And, you know, nothing too dramatic going on so that's always good and relaxing well except in video games where it is <laughs> the most dramatic week in video games because this is e3 summer game fest whatever you want to call it season time of year yeah <laughs> um i think everybody is just defaulting to calling it e3 season because summer game fest doesn't roll off the tongue that easy and everybody's still kind of stuck in thinking of it as E3 and maybe it'll be E3 again. And we'll talk about that here in a minute, but we're going to jump on into news because there is a ton of news to talk about this week. So destroy all humans. We talked, it seems like just a, a few weeks ago about the multiplayer game that's coming out. They are also remastering destroy all humans too. Or I, I guess actually this is a remake. This isn't a remaster. This is a complete remake. 
uh, like they did with the original Destroy All Humans. It is called Destroy All Humans 2 Reprobed, which is <laughs> both, a title. <laughs> both a terrible name and also like the most appropriate, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, that's coming out August thirtieth, um, and those are those are okay games. Those are you know entertaining diversions and everything. I, I don't think the S- Destroy All Humans games are great, but uh, I, I did play the first one and enjoyed a, a bit of it. Um, Alicia, I feel like this is going to be something up your alley. They. Uh, the director of the original Silent Hill film is out there talking about that he is working on a new Silent Hill film. He has written a script, and is, they are talking about making this movie, and it's apparently going to be a complete, uh, completely separate from the previous two films. Alicia, are you a Silent Hill fan? For some reason, I picture you as a Silent Hill fan. <laughs> I, I've honestly never given it a shot. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. I don't like scary things. So. Well, what are you doing with your person, that hockey mask, Alicia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, Silent Hill is one of those. There's a specific Let's Player on YouTube, Rowan Mithril, who has played all of them. And so I might be willing to watch his playthroughs. But just overall, it's one of those that I can appreciate how much everybody else loves it. But it's. Just not my vibe. All right. I'm going to say, I, I do love the Silent Hill films. Um, I think they were done really well. And also, I'm a gay, so I'm obligated to be attracted to Pyramid Head <laughs> uh, in any way, shape, or form. So I'm, I'm looking forward to Pyramid Head's return in these movies. Is is Pyramid Head a gay icon? Yes, absolutely. Is he like the Baba Duke? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my favorite things is when the Baba Duke became a, a queer icon. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Wait, how'd this happen? <laughs> it, it, it was just natural. We welcomed them with open arms. <laughs> uh, the Baba Duke is a fantastic film, if you haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first Silent Hill film, I don't even know if I ever saw that second one, but the first one was pretty good for mm-hmm. a video game movie yeah um, but how does it hold up against sonic uh, like the best <laughs> video game movie <laughs> i don't know if i can go that far with sonic <laughs> <laughs> i think sonic's a very solid movie mm-hmm. um and it's like not a disaster which is everything <laughs> that you, <laughs> everything that you expected of that film based on other video game films and based on the Sonic games, you <laughs> just expected that to be kind of a train wreck. And the fact that it came out competent was like <laughs> such a surprise. You wound me, Justin. <laughs> I mean, Sonic is that student who comes in the first day of class 20 minutes late and they have like forgotten everything and they're <laughs> having to borrow a piece of paper and a pencil and you're like, oh, they're just setting the expectations so low on day one. <laughs> and so anything they do, like any assignments they get turned in, you're like, oh, you are achieving. And <laughs> that is Sonic the movie. That is a fair assessment. <laughs> you wound me. <laughs> well, we're going to talk some more about Sonic here in a minute. Um, Let's see, other news, Uh, Enrico Riccardi, um, which I may not be pronouncing that correctly, but um, a pretty prominent figure in the classic game collection scene, Um, this came out that he has been accused of committing over $100,000 in fraud. Wow. That's a lot of money. When we talk about classic games here, too, we're talking about really classic games. So the game that actually kind of spawned this um, and the way that people figured out that he was apparently committing fraud was it's a 1979 game. Um, So it's a computer disc. It's not a cartridge, not for a a system or anything, but it's a computer disc. Uh, People who are really into the scene collect those they want to have like here's the original copy this is what you bought if you bought this game at that time um 
at that point in time, games sometimes weren't even coming in a full box. They were sometimes just sewed in like basically a sandwich bag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, they were being sewed at local computer stores and that sort of thing. There wasn't a a Babbage's or Electronics Boutique or GameStop to go to and buy these. Um, And basically he was making forgeries of these games. Um, And the way that people found out is they found out with this one game and then that prompted people to post other copies of things that he had sold and compare them to legitimate copies that people had. And they were getting down to looking at the printing on the labels of these discs. So they were noting that um, in some cases, the printing on some of these was obviously done by a modern printer because, um, you know, getting down to the, the dot Uh, pattern on it and everything, you know, whether there was the right dot pattern and that sort of thing on them. Um, Which, you know, I think it's just interesting because video game collecting as an investment has really become a big thing in the last few years as people start to grade old video game cartridges and that sort of thing. Um, And the idea that, you know, fraud being a pretty big issue, um, that's been common and that people have made for forgeries of these old carts. And so you'll see people selling say old game boy cartridges, but the gray of the cartridge isn't the right color gray Mm -hmm. because it's a reproduction. It's not an original, Um, you know, as the value of those investments goes up, obviously that's going to attract more forgeries and people are going to have to be more careful about what they're investing money into. Um, I would also say that, you know, this is a good reason why emulation is a, is the only safe way in a lot of Mm -hmm. ways to play some of this old software. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you can't be sure what you're out there buying. And, you know, if you're going to invest, in this case, thousands of dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Um, why? Just to play some piece of software that, you know, at this point is 40 years old and you can play just as easily um, after a few minutes downloading on your computer. Mm-hmm. So um, I am not pro piracy, but I am pro <laughs> allowing people to play things that they otherwise would have no ability to play. Um, let's see in some positive news to balance that out, the dragon age Q and a team, um, has voted to unionize. So this is the second Q and a team after Raven software's Q and a team, um, also voted to unionize. So this seems like a trend, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I hope it just keeps on snowballing and all of the uh, QA people can get a union. Because I love Dragon Age and I love QA workers, so uh, maybe yeah. we won't get so many horribly unreleased games if they have better QA, if they have better benefits as QA <laughs> workers. Yeah, I mean, you're getting the lowest people on the totem pole, really, in the game industry. Uh, mm-hmm. The QA people, these people have traditionally often not even been uh, salaried workers or mm-hmm. not full time workers. They're brought in and they work for a short period of time, and then are laid off. And this seems great that they're starting there. And then the hope is obviously, right, that it works its way up into more of the senior level developers. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. You know, union, unions protect people and the mm-hmm. video game industry has shown that it cannot protect itself. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Alicia, back to Sonic. <laughs> This one is up my alley. (laughs) Uh, Footage has been shown from Sonic Frontiers, the new Sonic game. Um, In fact, Sega had a little show the other day where they showcased some of this, and then there was some footage on IGN and everything. You have been messaging us in our group on (laughs) Facebook. (laughs) Uh, Quite excited about this. So let's talk about Sonic Frontiers. What are your reactions to Sonic Frontiers? You know... I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, I think I the first because I've been following the IGN previews, and the first couple I was a little more iffy than I was hoping to be. Just 
the music does not match the tone, and some of it did look pretty underdeveloped. And then they had the gameplay preview with the person narrating who got to play like four hours of the game, and he was talking about, you know, all of this footage and the version that he played was still a pretty early beta. So I'm hoping that that means that a lot of the kind of issues that people are having will be taken care of before the final release. I also really wish, because one of the things, you know, regardless of the quality of gameplay or story in any Sonic game, one thing that always, always, always does well is the music. And every preview of Sonic Frontiers just has the same track. And it's a very pretty track, but it doesn't really capture, like, the high-energy kind of thing that you want from Sonic. It's sort of Zelda Breath of the Wild <laughs> piano music. Yeah. Which works for that game as an exploration game, but Sonic as this super fast action-based game, it doesn't feel the same fit. Exactly. And I'm like, I know you've got to have better music up there for Sega. Like, every, even Sonic 06 had phenomenal music, and look how much of a hot mess that game was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, they could just play Escape from the City on a constant loop. Play Escape, game. play City Escape, play, you know, Johnny Jelly from Crush 40 has been doing a bunch of fan projects lately. Play some of that. Like, give me something. Give me some energy in this. Like, I know they're going for this whole mysterious, like, Sonic doesn't really know what's going on. He's on this planet by himself. He's figuring it out. But I just, I don't know. As someone who started with, like, the adventure era and Sonic Heroes and that, I love the cast of characters in Sonic. Like I don't I don't want to see Sonic by himself that much. I want to see everybody. So I think for me I'm like I I really I I need more to get me as excited for this game as I would like to be. Am I still going to buy it when it comes out regardless? Yes. But I really am hoping that we get something more over the course. IGN's pr- doing different previews of it all month long, so I'm hoping that we really get something to build the hype rather than just, oh, look how pretty the open zone playthrough is. Give us more Big the Cat. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I would be down for that at this point. Like, just give me something. And show me that you know how to pronounce your own character's name, Sega. They're doing a... I want to say it's a mobile game. And they're like, we're bringing back... Mephilis the Dark. It's like Mephiles. <laughs> it's or or Memphis, Tennessee. Like give us <laughs> give us the right pronunciation of your own character's name. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean when I first saw this footage, the very first footage that released of this, the first gameplay footage, my reaction was this feels like a tech demo. Yeah. This doesn't look like a real game. And you said beta, and I'm not sure. Have they said that this is a beta, not an alpha? Do you know? I know that I think everything IGN's been showing has been beta because when when I was watching the gameplay preview and he was talking through playing the game for four hours, he said, he's like, you know, Admittedly, what I was playing was an early beta, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't look like any of the footage is different from that video to the other ones. So I assume that all of it is beta footage. I hope. Sega, please. (laughs) And you would think they'd be at the beta stage now for a game that they are talking about releasing this year. So, um, But yeah, I mean, for a beta, that didn't look like a beta game, that first footage. It looked like a tech demo. Like, maybe an alpha at the very latest. Um, And it was cool kind of seeing Sonic run around in this open world environment, but it didn't look like much of a game. Yeah. You know, and that was the reaction I kept having looking at it was, where's the game in this? Yeah, they really need to tell us what the story is. And I think some of those later videos have shown more gameplay-centered footage. And I think my understanding, do I have this right? Maybe I'm misunderstanding this. That that's sort of a hub world and that you're going to go off into zones separate from that? Unclear. (laughs) Um, I think it's... This is 
Oh, that's a mess. I think that the intention is, yeah, that it's kind of a hub world and then you're going into, and it's just non-linear what zones you go into. So mm-hmm. rather than like stage one, stage two, it's, oh, you're here and then you go here. But also they have like enemies in the hub world that I'm, I'm really not sure what they're doing. Like the combat system looks cool. I like getting to see Sonic do throw kicks and punches and not just have to spin dash and all that. But I, I just, I don't know what's going on, man. Yeah. I I think I, I had read something, somebody describing it that way. And I wasn't sure if that was actual like reality or if that was somebody hypothesizing that was the way the game was going to play out. That's the vibe I've gotten from what I've seen and read. Yeah, and I know, like, that's always been my reaction to it because how does Sonic play in this open world? Like, how is that a game? And, Mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't wrap my head around it, and I kept thinking back to, well, we did this in Sonic Adventure. There was sort of an open world hub, and then you'd go off into the individual levels, and that makes sense for a Sonic game. And Um, Sega has actually said they're they're not calling it open world. They're calling it open zone, which is... What I assume they mean with this, okay, it's like Sonic Adventure and 06 where we have a hub world and then you go and do the missions, but it's non-linear instead of linear like those games were. Yeah, and if that's the case, having an open zone, open world, having essentially Peach's Castle from Mario 64 where you can explore it, but like you have to go in and play separate levels, that makes it what we've seen so far make a whole lot more sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can see that actually working better. Um, I agree with you. The music's still odd for a Sonic game. <laughs> I'm sure I'm, I'm, they must be holding out because they know that's the one thing they've done well every single game. <laughs> they must be holding out on that for the end of the IGN preview, end of the month, give us the title track. Like, it, that's the only explanation I can think of for them giving us one song and it being such a pretty but not hype song. <laughs> think how weird it is. Like Sonic kickstarted more than any other game, kickstarted that 90s attitude era of video game mm-hmm. characters where you had all these mascot characters. You know, Sonic is directly responsible for giving us Bubsy the Bobcat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Whatever hate you have for Bu- Bubsy, it's Sonic's fault. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at something like that and you say, well, now we're going to <laughs> class Sonic up. And it's like, no, Sonic's supposed to have attitude. He's supposed to be, you know, sort of anti authority. I mean, he never really was, but like, you know, he's the character that if you left him alone, he would sit there and tap his foot and look at you. you know, and eventually jump of off. Like <laughs> Yeah. So like it it doesn't it doesn't work with that character, right? Like you can have the piano orchestra with Mario a lot easier than you can with Sonic, mm-hmm. I feel like. Yeah. Well and even I think the piano orchestra can work. It just can't be the only thing. Right. Like you've got to You know, one of the great things about the Sonic games, especially in the adventure era, and I would say 06 did this too, is like each character really has like a musical theme. And I keep talking about 06 because I've been listening to that soundtrack while I'm working on homework a lot. But like the pretty piano stuff worked for Soliana and Princess Elise. Mm -hmm. But Sonic's got to have, like you said, that 90s, Kind of alt rock, kind of edgy, not edgy the hedgy, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Sonic music, uh, they also talked a bit more about Sonic Origins. This is their collection of Sonic 1 through 3 and Knuckles and Sonic CD. Um, they're adding in um, animated cutscenes. They are taking these games that were originally presented in 4x3 and they're expanding them to widescreen. Uh, So all that's really cool. But one of the things that they did announce was that the music from Sonic 3 and Knuckles uh, will be missing some of the original music tracks. Did they say why? Yeah, Yeah, well, no. I don't think they have officially stated why. People think they know why. So... 
the story goes that with Sonic 3, that Michael Jackson mm-hmm. composed a few of the tracks for that game. Yeah. That he wrote some of the music. And over the years, when they've re-released that game or, or done ports of it, um, and I know specifically there was a port to the PC that they did, and they have removed those tracks. And apparently the tracks that they put into the game were always part of the game. And so the belief is that the Michael Jackson tracks were added in late into development and replaced some songs that had already been written, and they replaced those with the Michael Jackson tracks. And then now that there is some sort of hold up with the rights to the Michael Jackson tracks, and so they're having to remove those. Uh, Um, I was wondering if it was the Michael Jackson tracks. Yeah, and so for clarity, these are original compositions, supposedly by Michael Jackson. This is not like some, you know... It's not like they put Thriller into the game. Right. <laughs> this is this is not Moonwalker for the Genesis, where <laughs> there are, like, little chiptune versions of, you know... Um, smooth Criminal. Uh, yeah, Smooth Criminal and, and several of his other songs. Um, so, yeah, the kind of... Kind of disappointing, and again, this is, you know, Sega, as part of releasing this, is actually removing um, Sonic for sale on some platforms, some of these old games, trying to encourage or force people into buying this new compilation. And again, this is one of the reasons we need emulation, Mm -hmm. so that we don't lose those original versions, because even if these might be better in a whole lot of ways, they are going to be lacking in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, Most people would not notice, however. So, you know, most people will probably be pretty happy with these. Um, Speaking of being happy, GameStop (laughs) employees in Lincoln, Nebraska were not happy um, with their district manager, who they accused of being verbally abusive. And so they just walked out. Um, there was an image going around online of this where they had posted a sign on the door that said, hey, we all quit. Um, we're not going to continue to work in an environment like this um, and shut down the store, um, which is, you know, I think, again, kind of tying into this idea of unionization and mm-hmm. the way some employees feel treated, uh, particularly at these lower level jobs and everything like you're hourly GameStop employees. Um, and so uh, kind of interesting to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's really, really good um, that the current state of employment is that people can get another job really quickly so they can walk out of jobs like this uh, because everybody's hiring and saying nobody wants to work. Um, but the thing is nobody wants to work for crappy wages for an abusive person. Um, I've worked a lot of retail and fast food jobs and I worked with a lot of abusive district managers. It's, almost like a meme, like that there's going to yeah. be an abusive district manager. So um, I wish that the job market had been such as I could just walk out on a job uh, with an abuse. I mean, I was fired by an abusive district manager at one point too. So um, I wish I had been in a situation where I could just walk into another job too. It wasn't in Lincoln, Nebraska, was it? It was not. Okay. <laughs> Probably not the same abusive district manager in well, this case. Uh, so it was a district manager for Blockbuster Video. So, they're, so they're he's out of a job somewhere. now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so he might have moved <laughs> over to GameStop. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Been out of a job. Um, yeah, here in town, here in Carbondale, Illinois, where we record and all of us live at least part of the year, um, the local Starbucks is actually trying to unionize right now. So that's been going on at several Starbucks around the country. Um, Apple stores have been trying to unionize different stores around the country. So, yeah, I think all this is because for the first time in a very long time, the pie is on the side of the retail employees Mm -hmm. because there is such a a need for Mm -hmm. workers, right, that you can easily quit and go, you know, a block down the street and get another job. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, Being not enough workers is not good in the grand scheme of things, but like this is the silver lining of it, Mm -hmm. that it is maybe giving employees uh, a chance to change things and change things, hopefully for the long term. 
Um, let's see. Nintendo is reportedly working on a sequel to One Two Switch called Everybody's One Two Switch, which is an odd title. Um, it is supposedly going to support up to 100 players at once. Uh, the way that this is supposedly going to be done is uh, apparently the Jackbox games were part of their inspiration. So some of the games will allow you to interact and play via your cell phone. Mm-hmm. Um, it is apparently in development hell. Now, this is all reported. This is not anything official coming out on Nintendo. Apparently, the game is complete, and the people who have tested it have told Nintendo it is really bad. Yeah. And Nintendo is in a position of, do they release a really bad game at $60 uh, that is probably going to you know, create some backlash against them because this is a bad game and people aren't going to be happy with it? Um, or do they spend more money to further develop this and maybe turn it into something good, but it's already a sequel to a game that a lot of people weren't looking for. Even people who liked 1-2-Switch weren't exactly calling for a sequel to 1-2-Switch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, so th- this is kind of interesting because we don't hear these sort of behind-the-scenes details before a game like this gets released mm-hmm. that often that you know, early testing of it is negative and that the company doesn't know what to do with the game. Um, yeah, and Nintendo's usually really good with not releasing bad games. Um, well, I mean, not necessarily not releasing bad games, but, like, making sure that a game is fully developed before it goes out. Yeah. So um, I'd be surprised if they let it go out when it was testing this bad. Yeah, like, not every Nintendo game is great, but mm-hmm. usually there's a certain level of quality yeah. we expect out of a Nintendo game. And I, I say think, usually it's not like, okay, we have to wait for the DLC to be able to mm-hmm. play an actual right. finished game. Right, and I, I think that's the issue that they're running into with this, is that it is not even up to the lowest Nintendo quality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whatever that is, uh, a Pokemon game. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, you are just coming for me today. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I, the Pokemon games are generally, I'll say a Pokemon spinoff game because the the mainline Pokemon <laughs> games are usually very good. Some of the spinoff games uh, are a little bit more shady. Uh. Um, but the mainline games are usually at least quality products, right? Like even if they don't fully land always. Um, speaking of not fully landing, Blizzard has released Diablo Immortal. This is the portable Diablo game. It was originally developed for cell phones. They have made a version that also runs on PCs because, hey, we're not getting Diablo 4 anytime remotely soon. (laughs) And it is officially their lowest Metacritic rated game ever in the history of Blizzard. Uh that's not that hard to do because Blizzard has a very <laughs> good track record mm-hmm. historically with their games. You have to remember, this is Blizzard. This is the people who make World of Warcraft and the original Warcraft series and StarCraft and um, the Diablo games, like some of the most classic video games in history. Um, but still, this says something. This game is very divisive right now. So, uh, oh, I've read so much about this. I am so angry at this. So when Diablo 3 was originally coming out and they said they were going to do a real money marketplace, I was angry. Um, And I wasn't going to buy Diablo 3, but then they made it so it wasn't like super game changing. But this, um, I've heard different stories about to be fully geared up, you have to spend like $50,000 to $100,000 on a mobile game. Yes. And there are people who have been playing it who have spent more than $10,000 and they haven't gotten one piece of what would essentially be end game gear. So what happens is that you have slots for gems in your equipment and then those gems have slots inside of them. So you need to get a five star original slotted gem and then get that will have five slots in it that you have to get five other five star gems to put in. And all of those are gotcha items. Holy extortionism, so, Batman. Right. And it would take over 10 years of constant playing to get anywhere near that um, in the game and as free to play. Um, but yeah, people are like saying like, yeah, I spent like $10,000 and I have do not have a single five star yet. 
it, wow it's, it's that low <laughs> i have no words except holy extortionism batman right right this game my understanding is actually banned in finland you can't download it. You can't play it in Finland because uh, essentially the system that you're describing is gambling. Mm -hmm. As far as the, the government there views it, that this is gambling. Mm -hmm. You know, you're opening loot boxes and yep. you're buying blind boxes and everything, mm -hmm. hoping to get these items. Um, you know, a few years ago, there was talk in the U.S. about potentially passing some legislation against this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is going to change because this is so successful in, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the mobile market. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it changes without legislation. I mean, but ten fifty thousand dollars that's my entire mm -hmm. college debt into <laughs> right. a single mobile game. <laughs> yeah. And that's like minimum if you're very lucky to get fully geared out. That is buck wild. Mm hmm. I mean, it's crazy that people are spending yeah. that much money, right? Yeah. But, it's but, crazy that they're being asked to spend that right. much money. <laughs> all, all I know is that I'm on the wrong career track because if I can make a mobile game where people are dropping like $10,000 like it's nothing, then I, sh I should have went into video game development. But seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for people listening who may not know, like, in the mobile game market, there are people who are described as wells. Mm -hmm. And that is who these people are who are dropping thousands of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea is that we need one well because there's going to be 50 of you who don't put any money mm -hmm. or put 2 or $3 mm -hmm. dollars into it. Um, and so that one well kind of spread out over hundreds of players who put zero money into it mm -hmm. or just a couple of dollars balances it out and everything. But, you know, it, it continues to come back to the point that this is seems like a very terrible system mm -hmm. uh, for the players. Um, it obviously makes money for these d developers um, if they can get the hit game, if they can be the next Clash of Clans or you know mm -hmm. uh, Clan Royale. If they can be that next game, they can make a lot of money. But the problem long term seems to be, and what I hear from a lot of people is they just don't play games on their phones anymore. Mm -hmm. this is what they expect out of every game. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, you know, Apple has tried to respond to this with Apple Arcade, their subscription service, and none of those games have any sort of uh, microtransactions in them. Um, but, you know, like for me, at least, I just don't download a lot of games. Like, mm -hmm. I, I really like Diablo. I have not downloaded this because why? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like an empty exercise at some point. I'd yeah. rather go back and play Diablo 3 some more. Mm -hmm. Port Diablo 3 to something <laughs> <laughs> to my phone. Um, speaking of Apple, Apple at their worldwide developer conference announced their new M2 chip. So if you currently have one of the new Apple Silicon Macs, um, which they have pretty much ported all of their Macs over to this, except for the Mac Pro, their uh, tire system, um, then that is running off some variation of the M1 chip. So now for their new uh, iPad Airs, they rolled out this new M2 chip. This isn't hugely related to video games, other than that this chip is significantly faster, is significantly uh, better graphics built into it. Um, and the you know they were showing some charts about how this compares to the, um, you know, to a dedicated discrete graphics card in a laptop and that sort of thing. They announced alongside this a port of Resident Evil 8 Village uh, coming to the Mac. You know, Macs are still not gaming PCs. They probably are never going to be, but it's getting weirder and weirder because Apple has a chip in <laughs> all these computers and they've mm -hmm. kind of standardized these chips at this point mm -hmm. and it's pretty capable. I mean, it may not be able to run the most bleeding edge game in 4k 120 frames per second, but it can run a lot of these games pretty decently. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it continues to sort of baffle that Apple doesn't invest more into this. I guess, you know, they just don't see the value in it. So uh, really they're missing the, 
fifty thousand dollars people put into it. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, and with Apple Arcade, right? Like they are investing on their phones and their tablets and the Apple TV device, not the Apple TV streaming service, because. Apple confusingly names everything the same thing. <laughs> um, they are, you know, investing into games in that area, so it's weird they don't do it with their Macs. Um, speaking of flawed companies and video games, Intellivision is laying off significant number of their staff to help save their Amico project. So for those who aren't familiar, the Amico was originally supposed to be a fairly low cost device, uh, a home console. It comes with two controllers. The two controllers basically kind of look like smartphones. They have, um, they have basically a touchpad over most of the controller and then a little directional controller on there as well. Um, but the idea behind the Amico was that it was going to be real low price games and they would be family-friendly games and games that you could play sitting around a couch together and everything. Um, some of them remakes or reimaginings of classic and television games. And you were going to be able to use those controllers, but also use your cell phone to interact with them. It's been nothing but a disaster. Um, the entire way, um, you know, the people involved with this have really kind of sullied their name at this point. It it does not seem like something that's ever going to actually come out and get a release. And with each news story that comes out, it seems more and more unlikely that this will ever actually get released. And frankly, I'm less likely to buy something if they're laying off staff to save a project. Like, it's just like, like yeah, I would rather not those a good people look. be paid. <laughs> Um, not laying off anyone, but, uh, kind of, um, letting things kind of slow down and come to an end in development. EA is abandoning Battlefield 2042 development. This is the newest Battlefield game that just came out last fall. They deny this, uh, but multiple people have come forward and said, yeah, there's really a skeleton crew making sure that they meet their obligations. They sowed a season pass with this. They're making sure they meet the obligations that they have to, so they don't have to give any refunds, but they are basically abandoning this game and moving the resources over to the next battlefield game, trying another shot at this. Um, that's sad for the people who bought that game and invested time and money into it. The flip side is the Battlefield series was once a really, really good game series, and it would be nice to see them actually get one right. Mm -hmm. uh, Forza Horizon 5 is getting a Hot Wheels expansion, according to an image on uh, the Steam page for the game. Uh, this hasn't been officially announced. Maybe this weekend it'll be announced at Microsoft's press conference. Um, they have done this before with, I believe it was Forza Horizon 3, that uh, had a Hot Wheels expansion. So this is not completely bizarre to think they <laughs> might do this. Um, and when they did that, that was like adding, you know, like tracks and everything that were more styled in the Hot Wheels. Um, you had some loop-de-loops and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that could be a lot of fun. Um, God of War Ragnarok has reportedly been delayed to 2023. This is maybe the least surprising news in the world. <laughs> um, another game getting delayed, another big, big game getting delayed. Um, the only thing that makes this a little weird is they were out there a couple weeks ago showing the accessibility features for this game, showing some of the ways to make it more accessible for players who might have different disabilities and everything. Um, so... Showing that off made it seem like it was probably pretty far along and pretty close to being finished, um, but maybe not. But again, that's just a report. Um, that's not anything confirmed yet. Well, if they're making it accessible like that early in the process and not just waiting till the end to slap some things on it, I'm really supportive of that, like having the accessibility integrated into it early on. Yeah, that to me, I've never played a God of War game, but that alone to me makes me interested. Sony's been really sort of doubling down on that in their games lately. They've really... As leaned, they should be. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I agree. Um, but, you know, really leaning into it. And I, I don't think a lot of people understand, like when you talk about accessibility, um, I was playing Sniper Elite 5. Um, and one of the first things you do in that game is resize the text. It says, yeah. hey, is this text readable for mm-hmm. you? And, um, you know, it's not just that. It's, you know, color blindness for a mm-hmm. lot of people with games mm-hmm. and, like, offering multiple color blindness settings mm-hmm. because not a single setting yeah. works for everyone. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of different things that people come to these games that have different disabilities. One of the classic ones for the God of War games is um, in the original God of War games, when you open treasure chests, you had to repeatedly hit a button. Mm-hmm. And that's difficult for some people to smash a button repeatedly. Mm-hmm. And so they made it so that you could just hold the button in the newer games nice. and that's easier for some players to do. I'd um, love to see that. That's some positivity in the gaming world. Yeah. That, that has been a very positive story over the last mm-hmm. five, 10 years mm-hmm. in video games is that they've really leaned in a, to accessibility in a way that they never have before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think it's a, a very much a net good for the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this just made me kind of happy because it's kind of a goofy thing. They're releasing a Bill & Ted's Excellent Retro Collection for the PlayStation 4 and 5, Switch, and PC. No Xbox version as of now. Uh, this contains two games, Bill & Ted's Excellent Video Game Adventure for the NES and Bill & Ted's Excellent Game Boy Adventure, colon, a bogus journey <laughs> <laughs> for the Game Boy. Um That's just kind of cool and fun, and, you know, that's nothing I ever expected to see. (laughs) Uh, I I don't even know if I knew that Game Boy game existed. I I have played the NES game. That's kind of a fun game, Um, but, um, you know, kind of neat. So, um, and that's the sort of thing where, yes, I encourage emulation if you can't access a game, but when companies are putting games back out like this, you know, you can just go buy the Mm -hmm. version they're putting out. Um, Xbox cloud streaming is coming to Samsung's 2022 line of smart TVs. So if you buy one of the 2022 models of Samsung smart TVs, you will this fall sometime be able to stream games directly from Xbox cloud to that TV through an app on that TV. Um, you know, we've talked before uh, about a month ago about them selling a little device that would plug in like a Roku stick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether that's still happening or not, I don't know, but they are doing this. This was rumored at the same time as that. Um, Obviously not everyone has a smart TV. Not everyone has a Samsung TV. Not everybody has a Samsung TV is going to go buy a 2022 model. Mm -hmm. So they need to do something more than this, but this is a good first step. Well, like we have a Vizio, and I think we're we're getting close to needing to buy a new one. Um, and this would switch me over to buying a Samsung TV. I think. Yeah, I mean, if you can just buy a controller mm-hmm. and you know Bluetooth connect it to your TV and start playing some games, um, this seems really really cool on their part. Um, Xbox is also launching something called Project. Uh, Mooncraft, uh, excuse me, Project Morecraft, uh, which is to bring more demos to Game Pass Ultimate. Uh, Companies in return get lots of analytic data back about who's playing the games for how long and everything. Uh, This seems like their effort to compete with Sony, who is also, as part of their new PlayStation Plus top tier, is going to offer game demos so this just seems um, the same thing. And if you're going to make a demo for the PlayStation version of your game, why wouldn't you make it for the Xbox as well? Mm-hmm. Um, I say that as if I'm a game developer. And I, have any <laughs> idea. <laughs> I would think if you're making a demo for one, it would be pretty easy to make it for the other system. But what do I know? Um, the ESA plans that E3 will return in 2023 as an in-person event. At the same time, Summer Games Fest has also said next year they will have an in-person component. So this should be interesting. 
who wins this? Summer Games Fest has established itself during the COVID period as the dominant game announcement format. Mm -hmm. Um, But obviously E3 still has the name recognition because we are still calling it E3 season. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'll be it'll be interesting. That might be the first time that I really pay attention to everything as it's happening. You know, I've usually been like, okay, I'm gonna wait till the IGN articles come out to yeah. notice what games I actually am interested in. But I I enjoy competition, so I <laughs> I might actually pay attention to both that time and be like, okay, who's doing better? <laughs> well, and the two competing against each other can't probably hurt. Um, you know, at least in the short term, maybe if they try to keep this up over the next 10 years, maybe that is a problematic, but at least in the short term, maybe it makes them both get better. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is not something we normally cover. This is more around personnel. Um, but I think this is kind of interesting and added in here late. Um, Jeff Gertzman, who is a very well-known figure in the video game journalism area, Um, has been covering video games for basically 30 years now, Um, was one of the early people covering video games online, at least professionally getting paid for doing it. He um, worked for GameStop, very or GameSpot, excuse me, um, the video game website, very famously got fired for refusing to um, edit one of his reviews of a game, uh, Kane and Lich 2 specifically, um, he refused to edit that in order to please an advertiser. He was fired from Game uh, Spot. He left along with several other staff members. He found at GiantBomb.com. He's been there the last 12 or so years. And he very, what felt very abruptly to a lot of people, just announced he's leaving Game uh, Giant Bomb. And um, that was uh, Monday that he announced he was leaving. Tuesday, he launched his new podcast and Patreon called The Jeff Gersman Show, which is just him right now. Um, so it's a one-person podcast, which is, I can't even begin to imagine trying to do a podcast <laughs> just by myself. That's a whole lot of talking. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he's a huge figure. He, he's one of the few people that's still around from that era mm-hmm. who, you know, he's... I, he in fact, has joked about that he's one of about like five journalists, uh, three or four journalists, actually, I think, who are still in the industry who have been to every in-person E3 Mm -hmm. over the years. Um, So there aren't a whole lot of people his age still doing what he does. So it's kind of cool to see him moving on to something new. So best of luck to him. Um, All right, let's get to the game show. So we've had two big shows in the last week. And we're going to kind of run through these and talk about some of the games and everything. I'll just go ahead and read through the games. And then if there's specific ones you want to talk about, just jump in and talk about them. Uh, We'll start off with the PlayStation State of Play. Um, They announced Final Fantasy 16 is coming summer 2023, next summer. I I was hoping for a more solid date, but I'm happy with summer 2023. So (laughs) (laughs) They did show off more gameplay, Mm -hmm. like actual gameplay with an actual interface on the screen and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, It it looks like you're going to be playing as the summons, and that makes me so excited. Yeah, like, Ifrit is my ma- is my boy. <laughs> yeah, summons are always my favorite part of most of the games, so I'm really excited, especially after how they uh, did the summons kind of dirty in Final Fantasy uh, 15. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to see there's a lot more emphasis on them in 16. Yeah, I, one part of the footage to me looked a sort of Godzilla versus King Kong mm-hmm. thing. It was two of the summons just battling it out. It mm-hmm. seemed like you had control over them or yeah. some impact. Mm-hmm on the fight and everything. So that's pretty neat looking and something mm-hmm. new and different. Um, they announced a resident evil four remake. This has been rumored for quite a while. Um, and this is what has traditionally been the most popular of the resident evil series. Um, so they're giving it the full remake from the ground up. They've said that, um, this will not follow beat for beat the original game that they are allowing them to change up some things and everything for it. So this doesn't even seem like a gloss of paint over the original game. Um, Along with that, they announced that they will develop a VR mode 
for that Resident Evil 4 remake, and they are also making a Resident Evil 8 Village uh, VR mode. Um, both of these are for the PlayStation VR 2, at least so far. And these will get me to buy a PlayStation VR 2, unless they come out with, come out with it on the uh, Quest 2. So they already have Resident Evil 4 VR mm -hmm. on the Quest, but it's the original game. Right. It's not mm -hmm. this new remade version. Uh, so are you okay with playing horror games in VR? Uh, yes. Um, I I don't necessarily always like to be scared, um, but uh, I will I will play a video game and be scared. I still have random nightmares about the birds flying through the windows in the mansion in Resident Evil. <laughs> um, but uh, other, other than that, I'm pretty good with uh, playing a lot of horror games in VR. I'm just imagining that opening scene of Resident Evil 4 when you go into the village and the guy with the <laughs> chainsaw shows up trying to play that in VR because that's a pretty yeah. intense scene Oh yeah, just playing Absolutely. it normally. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess what we're saying is we are definitely going to make Alicia play this in VR. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, man, no. I will take a hard... I'll go update the controllers while you all play that. <laughs> hey, let us know if you want Alicia to, want to uh, play uh, Resident Evil 4 Remake in VR by emailing justin.young at siu.edu. I think we totally need to do that for Playing for Pets next year. People can pledge amounts of money, and then how could she possibly not do it for yeah. the... I will update <laughs> controllers all day long. <laughs> Um, they also announced, well, this has already been announced, but they showed off the first real footage of Street Fighter VI, also coming in 2023. Um, and the most interesting part of this, to me at least, was they showed a sort of open world mode of this, where you're going to be walking around Metro City, um, which, for those who don't know, Metro City is the city in the game Final Fight. Um, so that's the city that you're trying to save in Final Fight and everything. And they're showing you walking around in a fully 3D metro city. And you apparently just walk up to guys and engage into a fight. And it transitions <laughs> As into, one does. into the sort of side view that we're familiar with with Street Fighter. Uh, th that just looks kind of cool. And it looks like a fun way to you know, make that game maybe more accessible. Um, you know, Street Fighter, I, we talked about this earlier when we when this was announced, that um, Street Fighter 2 was such an accessible game. It was a game that everyone played, mm -hmm. even if you weren't good at it. I was never good at it. I could kind of play Chun-Li mm -hmm. decently. Um, but, like, over the years, those games have gotten so technical and so challenging that I just felt completely lost in them. And this kind of makes me interested in it again. Um, so good on Capcom, because I didn't know that anything would make me interested in a new Street Fighter game. <laughs> um, other VR game, Horizon is getting a VR game called Call of the Mountain. Um, this looked pretty neat. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to say about it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this also interests you, OJ, when you're looking at the VR. Um, yeah, definitely. So I haven't played the Horizon games yet. They're on my list to play. Um, but I think they look like absolutely solid games. So I, if I'm getting the PS2 VR2, then I might as well be getting this game too. Well, speaking of the non-VR Horizon mm -hmm. games, uh, Forbidden West, the most recent uh, game, um, is getting a major new update. And with that comes New Game Plus that was announced. So I love a New Game Plus too. So this is I'm more likely to, to play... The games now and like put them a little higher in my queue because like i just love a new game plus if you give me a new game plus i am ready to play a game this reminds me a lot of kind of what nintendo has been doing with their recent games where it feels like they hold some content back so that they can get that news bump by releasing something new they've mm -hmm. done this with um i know the tennis game was it aces where they released some new characters like months after the game had come out. Maybe they were actually developing those, but it also felt like maybe they were just holding a character back so they could kind of push it out. Mm. This kind of feels the same way. Like, well, maybe they had started development of this mode and they just couldn't get it in by the time of the release. Mm. But by pushing it out, it's getting that, that extra bump in the mm -hmm. news and everything. And mm. 
you know, that's good for the long-term uh, viability of these games so that they don't just disappear. Uh, Horizon Forbidden West had the terrible misfortune of coming out, I think, like a week before Elden Ring. Yeah. And it Ooh. just kind of got buried in the news cycle. Yeah. Um, they announced that Stray is coming July 19th, and it will be free for the top two tiers of PlayStation Plus, so not the basic, whatever it's called, essential, mm-hmm. but the extra and premium. I don't know what those tiers are called. This uh, makes I, me so sad that we don't have Ryan yeah. here today. And <laughs> I believe you mean it's coming out for the pss, 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 pss plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you haven't caught on, Stray is a cat game where you play a cat and you're walking around in sort of a cyberpunk city where robots uh, are apparently the only thing that exists. You don't see any other humans. Um, and it is a very just charming, adorable looking game. Um, it, it looks I fantastic. I don't like cats, and I want to play this game. <laughs> oh, man, you don't like cats? And you like Sonic? I'm allergic to cats. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's a valid reason not to like cats. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can only say that because Ryan's not here. He sits next to me, and he would probably, like, slap my shoulder or something. <laughs> I like that Ryan's reaction is to instantly turn to violence. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that would be my reaction if someone said they didn't like dogs. (laughs) Um, This is just kind of great. This game looks amazing. Um, You know, the animations and everything, it it just looks really fun. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it looks unique and, you know, something we haven't seen a million times. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get down to summer game fest. Um, but it looks fun, so kind of excited for that. Uh, the Walking Dead Saints and Sinners Chapter 2 Retribution, the most convoluted name in video. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is their VR game, the original Saints and Sinners. This is the sequel to that, or next chapter. Or, I, I don't think this is episodic in any way, so I guess this is considered a full sequel. Uh, this was also shown off for PlayStation VR 2. Um, that first Saints and Sinners game is apparently very popular uh, with VR players. I have not played it myself, but it's apparently very popular. Um, Eternites is an anime game, so we also need Ryan here <laughs> to fully appreciate it. Um, they also showed off a game that I thought looked just amazing, Roller Drome, which is a sort of futuristic, cel-shaded uh, roller derby style game, except you have guns. And so you're shooting the other players <laughs> instead of just like elbowing them into the sides or, um, you know, you're, there's no alligator in the middle of the rink or anything like the, um, uh, what was the name of that show? There was an old show in the, the late eighties of roller derby and there were alligators in the middle, mm-hmm. and that, and at one point what? you could like you could jump <laughs> over them, and uh, you could knock your opponents into the water with them. Oh my gosh, I love it! <laughs> the show used to come on after uh, Saturday morning wrestling, like WWF wrestling, and they would have this show on after it. Okay, um, see, I was excited for Roller Drone, but now what's the point if there's no alligators? <laughs> <laughs> the Roller Drone still looks amazing. It does uh, look very mm, cool. But I am slightly disappointed that there are no alligators in it. If you're listening, add an alligator. Uh, Get zone. an alligator mm, mod. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Start working on it now. <laughs> uh, last bit of news out of this show was Tunic is coming to PlayStation in September. Tunic's mm-hmm. a fantastic game. People should play that. It's mm-hmm. fantastic that more people are going to get a chance. So play Tunic in September if you only have a PlayStation. Um, the other big show was the Summer Games Fest. Uh, this actually just happened yesterday, and so lots of news out of it. The biggest takeaway from this, if you weren't watching it live, was that everybody is making a dead space. <laughs> <laughs> Of the first, like, seven games they showed off as part of this show, six of them were Dead Space likes. (laughs) I am not joking when I say this. They were, you're in outer space, you're on a space station, on a spaceship, and monsters are trying to kill you. 
And it was just game <laughs> after game after game of this. So let's get into it. <laughs> they showed off Aliens Dark Descent, a dead space. <laughs> now, in fairness, dead space is obviously inspired mm-hmm. in part by the alien films and everything. But uh, this looked like a, a four player cooperative shooter, mm-hmm. sort of a, a Left for Dead like and mm-hmm. everything set in the Aliens universe. Um, you know, Graphics look neat and everything. Mm -hmm. It was hard to tell exactly what this game was entirely from the footage. Still looked interesting. Uh, They showed off uh, Callisto Protocol. Uh, They had actually shown a bit of this at the uh, PlayStation State of Play, but they showed a little bit more. They dated it. It's still supposed to come out this fall, December of 2022. Callisto Protocol is the direct spiritual Mm -hmm. sequel to the original Dead Space. This is some of the people who made those original Dead Space games trying to go back and make an entirely new game. And it looks just like Dead Space. (laughs) (laughs) It is very easy to look at this game and just think it's Dead Space Mm -hmm. if you didn't know any better. Um, They showed off a bit of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Um, was that also Dead Space? <laughs> <laughs> it was not. I would. Th- I was Call like Dead Space. How do how do we have modern warfare in Dead Space? <laughs> I mean, they did. That do... seems pretty futuristic warfare to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did do that one. Was that called Future Warfare? Was Probably. That, was that the one that they did? <laughs> um, and it was set in space, but there were no like monsters that I remember. You were fighting other people, so or aliens, that, but. Not horror uh, type see, uh, scenes in it. Uh, maybe one of the biggest surprises out of this show was they announced Flashback Two. So Flashback was a game that came out in the nineties. It is very much in that mode of um, a Prince of Persia and um, and oh, oh, out of this world. Out of this world. Um, what's the other one I'm thinking of? Black um, Blackthorn. Blackthorn, yes. Uh, It's very much out of those modes of 2D levels that you're having to get through and everything and super highly animated. Um, I'm just excited they're making a flashback too. It did look more action-oriented than the original flashback. Um, So that's cool, and I'm just very excited to see where this goes. Um, They announced a new game called Witchfire, which was... Sort of forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> Too much dead space. 7.8 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> they did show off a game called Fort Solace, which is a dead space like. <laughs> <laughs> they showed off a game called Routine, uh, which has been in development since at least uh, 2012. Um, and that is a dead space like. <laughs> They announced an expansion for Outriders called World Slayer. Um, Fall Guys, they showed a brief trailer, kind of just announcing again that it is coming to basically every platform and it is going free to play. So if you have missed out on Fall Guys previously, Fall Guys is a fun game to play. I did not stick with it long term, but it's really fun to play. Um, It's very much the sort of, most extreme elimination challenge, Takashi Castle, you running through obstacle courses and, you know, getting waylaid. Wipeout might be another good example to compare mm-hmm. it to. Uh, they announced uh, Stormgate and showed a, a CG trailer kind of for it. Uh, Stormgate is the former Blizzard uh, developers um, trying to make sort of a spiritual sequel to Warcraft and Starcraft. Mm. Uh, they showed off High Water, uh, American Arcadia, Goat Simulator Three, <laughs> which is a dead space, a dead space <laughs> phone. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, from the trailer, it was very much uh, aping uh, Dead Island Two. It was a, a parody <laughs> of the Dead Island Two trailer. Mm-hmm. So not dead space, but still dead. Yeah, still dead, <laughs> and, and kind of. If you're wondering at home, because this was my initial reaction when I saw this game get announced. Was there a goat simulator too? No, there was not. (laughs) (laughs) 
That was my next question. I was wondering about that. I was like, I remember Goat Simulator, but I don't remember two. Mm-hmm. It, it felt like something they might have just pumped out and you just totally missed mm-hmm. it, right? Yeah. And no, they never made a Goat Simulator <laughs> 2. So kudos to them for just jumping straight to three. That is such... In the spirit of Goat Simulator, chaotic energy. <laughs> that is a good sort of airplane, you know, naked gun type joke. <laughs> like, we're just going to skip and go straight to part three. Actually, that that's a Spaceballs joke, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was getting the wrong film series there. Um, they showed off some more of Marvel's Midnight Suns. This is their um, card-based sort of strategy game. <laughs> Yeah. I want to be excited for this game. It looks so cool. I love how customizable your character is. I love that you get to just hang out with the heroes and like build up your friendship with them and all that. But the fact that it's a card-based game, I can't. I don't enjoy card-based games. Like I really want to buy it and play it just for all of the rest of it, but that makes me feel like uh, I might just have to watch a walkthrough of this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they the, when this game was first announced, it got a very negative reception because it was card-based and then over time, uh, they kind of they kind of just disappeared behind the scenes. Supposedly as part of that, they were trying to hide the fact that it was card-based. Um, and like by making them maybe not as clearly cards and making it more like, look, these are just abilities you can use. <laughs> well, and when you watch, they did a cinematic reveal trailer and that shows nothing of the card based right. <laughs> gameplay. It's not until you go watch the other stuff that you see. Uh, like I want, I remember playing the Marvel's ultimate Alliance games with my sister and just having a blast with that. And I want that back. And this could be that. <laughs> Have you played Ultimate Alliance 3 on the Switch? I have not. Yeah, so I I feel like that's the game a lot of Marvel fans want. They just want another one of those, right? Like, I don't know how well that sold on the Switch, but I feel like that's the game a lot of Marvel fans just want. Yeah. Like, just a a kind of simple pick-up-and-play action game. Pick-up-and-play. Give me, like, like... Playing the original one on the Wii, you know, you had different combo attacks depending on which play characters you were using. You got to run around, and so like I, I really want to be excited for Midnight Suns. And like the cinematic trailer looked amazing, but it's card based. <laughs> Marvel, why? <laughs> Just why? Yeah, that's a big hill that game is going to have to climb. Um, they showed off Cuphead, the delicious last course. This is their DLC. It's right there in the name, delicious last course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they've been kind of silent on this for a little bit, and they showed it off. It looks amazing, um, just like the original Cuphead did. The, it, maybe even more like detailed, more animated. This seems like maybe they could have just done a full sequel instead and maybe that's what this ends up feeling more like by the time it comes out and everything uh but you know it looks amazing if you haven't played cuphead you owe it to yourself you got to play cuphead it's one of the most beautiful video games ever made uh they announced a game called neon white uh which is sort of an anime cell shaded um looked like it was time attack based um They showed off Midnight Fight Express, which I thought looked amazing. Um, Sort of a beat-em-up, sort of a three-quarters overhead beat-em-up, but with lots of action, lots of different animations, lots of different moves and everything. Um, Just looked great. Looked over the top and fun. Um, I'm really excited by that. They showed off a couple of anime games, Honkai, Star Rail, and Zenless Zone Zero. And I, I've got to be honest, when they show these sort of extreme anime games where I have no connection to them, mm-hmm. my eyes kind of roll into the back of my head. <laughs> no. I'm I, I just like, somebody's going to enjoy these games, I hope. Um, they showed off some more of Ninja Turtles, Shredder's Revenge. They announced Casey Jones for the game mm-hmm. and that it's also going to have six-player local and online co-op which is just amazing and fantastic. They also, uh, this week, 
announced the collector's edition for that, which just is the most insane over the top collector's edition <laughs> uh, with tons of just junk to go along with it. <laughs> um, and I, hey, if somebody wants to put down $200 on that and buy the collector's edition, great, enjoy it. Uh, but the thing that's really cool is that in all the um, all the box versions of that game, you don't buy it digitally, you buy a box version, it is going to come with a coupon for a free individual Pizza Hut pan <laughs> pizza. So just like Perfect. the original NES game did. So that's amazing. As it should. Yeah. And good all on them is right that. in the world. <laughs> <laughs> good on them for that. Um, I feel like we're really missing Ryan here because they announced One Piece Odyssey uh, based on the long-running anime series. I think it's maybe one of the longest-running anime series. It is. It's been going almost my entire life. It started in March 1998. I will say I I don't dare get into One Piece, but my sister is obsessed, and she is very hyped. (laughs) So has she watched all of it? I don't know if she's watched all of it. I know she's watched a lot of it. Yeah, because it's like 20 plus years at this point. Yeah, it's long. (laughs) I think if she hasn't watched all of it, I sorry if I'm wrong here, Amelia. I think she's read all of it. Okay. And it it's basically like pirates battling fascist. It's yeah, that sounds like an arc that would have happened. <laughs> it's pirates going around and they're hunting the ultimate treasure. As pirates do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so they end up on like different islands and like you said, it's been going for almost twenty five years now, so Pirates versus Fascists <laughs> sounds like an arc they've done. <laughs> <laughs> um, they announced Soul Hackers 2 uh, Metal Hellslinger which I think looks amazing uh, this is a first person shooter where you have to shoot your gun to the beat of the music and all the music is heavy metal music hmm. and they've gotten like named heavy metal bands and, uh, and artists from bands and everything to come in and do the soundtrack for this and so it looks, you know, sort of like Doom, I guess, in that, you know, it looks like the cover of a heavy metal album from the <laughs> 80s. And um, they are playing this music, and you have to fire your gun to the beat of it and everything. It just looks amazing. Like, it may be a terrible game when it finally does come out. It may not play worth anything, but I'm not even a huge heavy metal fan or anything, but just the idea of, like, making this game, and I'm just thinking, like, 1980s would have eaten this game up. This would have been the <laughs> biggest game in the world. And so I'm just excited that these sorts of games are getting made. Uh, they showed off a game called Nightingale, Warhammer 40,000, Dark Tide. Uh, this is another sort of four player cooperative uh, shooter game, sort of like uh, Left 4 Dead. Layers of Fears, which is the third. Layers of Fear game. So it's Layers of Fear 1 and 2, and then now Layers of Fears. Um, They're really doing the Fast and the Furious name scheme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> Next is Layerings of Fears. <laughs> <laughs> layerings of Fearings. <laughs> so this the is, Layers of the Fears. <laughs> <laughs> two Layers, Two Fears. <laughs> um. Yeah, so this is from Blooper Team. This is the team that was uh, rumored to be working on a remake of some of the Silent Hill games, uh, of Silent Hill 2 specifically. So it's unclear if they actually are working on that or if this is what they're working on. Maybe they're working on multiple games at the same time. Uh, They showed off Gotham Knights, some more footage of that. That's the Batman game that doesn't have Batman. Batman is dead. (laughs) You have to find out what happened. I am am excited for that. I am a major Bat Family nerd. And so getting a larger cast of the Bat Fam in a video game always makes me happy. (laughs) So have you seen the CW show that's coming out next year, also called Gotham Knights? I have watched the trailer. So the, the, these two are not related, but they basically have the same premise to some degree in that Batman's dead, except in the TV show, instead of the game where it's Batgirl and Robin and Nightwing and was it the Red, Red Hood? Red Hood. 
Um, in the TV show, it is Batman's son, um, and then also the children of his various villains, like the Joker's daughter and some other characters are there and they have to team up and figure out who killed Batman. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. <laughs> that that uh, show looks I'm, terrible. <laughs> I will, you know, I've decided my rule on shows is three episodes. <laughs> I'm going to give it three episodes and we'll see. <laughs> God be with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I figure if you can suffer through um, five episodes of Halo, I, I can make it through three episodes of this. <laughs> OJ didn't even make it that far. <laughs> he had to call it quits first. Yeah. And he was actually excited to see yeah. uh, see Master Chief's butt. <laughs> yeah. So even, even his butt isn't worth that one. Episodes, so. And you're not going to see any bare butts on the CW. Sorry to disappoint you. Ah, <laughs> uh, darn. That really takes away the hype for me. <laughs> it's unfortunate because Roswell, New Mexico just came back as in uh, season four. So wouldn't mind seeing butts in that show. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been your weekly butt report. <laughs> And finally, the last big bit of news was they um, they showed off the new Last of Us multiplayer live service game they're working on. This is apparently not the original multiplayer that they were working on for the Last of Pl Last of Us Part Two. They've completely restarted it from the ground up. This is going to be a much much bigger project, um, so that's why it's not coming as part of Last of Us Part Two. It's going to be a standalone live service game and everything. Um, They're trying to be extremely ambitious with that. Um, they did, showed off some concept art, but not really anything significant for it. The bigger news, though, was that they are doing a Last of Us Part 1 remake. So this is the game that came out less than 10 years ago. They are doing a full <laughs> remake. They've already released a remaster. Mm -hmm. Or the PlayStation 4 that runs in 4K at 60 frames a second. They are doing a complete remake of it now. Why? Yes. Money. <laughs> <laughs> that is the right question, and, the, <laughs> and I believe the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, they have already announced this is selling for $70. Holy moly. <laughs> so full price for a first-party release on the PlayStation 5. And Remember when games were $30? <laughs> yeah, some were. Some, <laughs> yeah, there were some budget games and everything out there. I still remember NFL 2K5 coming out at $20 when they were really competing with Madden. And they were like, you know, <laughs> screw it. We're going to put it out at 20 bucks." And then Madden said, screw you. We're going to go get the exclusive NFL license. <laughs> uh, I remember when Super Smash Bros. Brawl being $50 for like eight years was too expensive for me. <laughs> That's a Nintendo game. Nintendo games never come down in price. <laughs> um, yeah, so they showed off some footage, some still screens of this and everything. There is definitely some improvements you can see. But, you know, I think when we think of remakes, we think of multiple console generations. This game is two or three console generations old. So you see a significant difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking at this... It's like, yeah, that's a prettier game, but I've already played it. And is it pretty enough to make me want to go back and play it again mm -hmm. and spend $70 to do so? And for me, I, I got to say, it's just not. Mm -hmm. And I, I really love that first Last of Us game. I think that's a fantastic game. I think it's a, one of the best PlayStation games ever, but not at not at $70 and not just to replay the same game basically over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's it for all the big news out of the shows. Uh, real quick, just kind of as a rundown here, uh, what else is coming up? Uh, this weekend on June 12th, the Xbox and Bethesda Games Showcase. Also on June 12th is the PC Gaming Show. June 13th is the Capcom Showcase. I would expect to see more about Street Fighter VI and some of their other titles there. June 16th, the just, I think, announced this morning, Final Fantasy VII 25th Anniversary Celebration Broadcast. I would expect to see the Final Fantasy Remake Part Two 
premiere at that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They, they have to. Yeah. <laughs> like the fact that we didn't get those dates from PlayStation pl- State of Play, mm-hmm. they have to announce the date yeah. at yep. this. And then finally, uh, June 21st, the Multiverses Pro Player Showcase. This is the new Warner Brothers, Smash Brothers like with all the Warner Brothers different characters, Shaggy and Superman and all sorts of characters are in that. I don't know if this is a tournament or exactly what this is. I assume they'll announce some new characters coming to that game. It's out right now in a closed beta, so I would expect that we'll see some announcements coming for it. Um, That's it for news for today. We're actually going to cut the show uh, a little short compared to what we normally do uh, because we just had so much news. We have already gone into about an hour and a half of the show. (laughs) Um, And, you know, as we said, this is E3 season. There is just a ton of news. Uh, Probably for our next episode, there will be, Slightly lesser news, though I imagine we'll be talking a lot about that Final Fantasy VII remake if it does indeed show up. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we'll try to get back to our normal format. But we did want to kind of like at least talk about, you know, everything that's happening this week because it was a ton and ton of news happening. Um, It'll probably be a couple more weeks before we're back with another episode. Um, Remember, it's our summer break and everything, so we're kind of going on a more infrequent uh, pacing and everything for these. But thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alicia and OJ, for joining me as well. If you have comments or questions, you can send those to justin.young at siu.edu, and we'll try to read those if we can on the air. Um, And then, you know, you can check out salukigames.com. You can find all of our old episodes on there as well as finding some different videos. There's a video up there of us playing the new Rift Tracks game. There's some student projects looking at the history of different game franchises, including OJ's on the history of Final Fantasy. Um, There's one on Call of Duty, another one on um, The Legend of Zelda. So there's some cool content up on there as well to engage with. But thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back soon with another episode.